Hello, I am Jesse Weiler here with Mother Jeanette Marie Estrada. Mother, how are you doing today? Yes, fine. It's a great. Thank you. Good. Uh, you know, this is the second time we've had you on the show, and I'm very excited. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about your vocation story, but what, what an amazing story that was. We'll, we'll talk briefly about that before we get into our, our main topic today. Uh, but before we begin, would you mind leading us in prayer? Sure. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Come upon us. We give you permission to take hold of our thoughts, of our affections, emotions, our soul. Guide this conversation, this interview. Guide it so it can bring a lot of fruit. So we can sing the praises of everything that Papa has done for us, for everything that Jesus continues doing for us. So it can be a moment of praise and thanksgiving for being such a great Papa to us. Come Holy Spirit upon Jesse and upon me and upon all the listeners so their hearts can be open to the action of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Lady of Mercy. Pray for us. Pray for us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much uh, for leading us in prayer. And usually a big part of the show uh, is that we talk a little bit about the the guest vocation story. And obviously you have a great story. And maybe some people heard this already, but I think it's worth mentioning at least again that you were, you. when you were younger, you were doing all of the girly things and going out and had a boyfriend. And in fact, uh, a key moment in your vocational story is you were literally skipping class and saw <laughs> one of the teachers coming down the, the hallway or heard and ducked into the chapel to hide because you were skipping <laughs> class and you heard a message from God. And like, yes. this is such an incredible vocation story. It's <laughs> almost unbelievable. But can you can you just walk me through that real quick again in case somebody didn't hear that uh, that story? Yes, yes. Just tell, tell I me I was that. At, the, at that moment about 15 years old. I am in high school and I normally skipped algebra, which is your ironic about that is that I normally skipped algebra class. And then I I served the people of God teaching algebra for 15 <laughs> years to high schoolers, to junior high students. So it's, it's the irony of it all. But yes, I am skipping class. So it is one of the sisters that already had me in her radar as not at the best of students. So I am running to the chapel so she doesn't give me another pink slip. And then as I walk into the chapel, there is another sister with a group of girls and she's reading Probably it was the antiphon uh, of that day uh, for Mass, but it is John 15, 16, that you have not chosen me, I have chosen you to go and bear fruit, and, it, and then it continues. So that just resonated in my heart. I'm probably, I don't know if that can be into the locution stories uh, of, uh, not because I'm a saint, it's just because God loves us so much that he give th gives those experiences to whomever needs it. And for sure, he got my attention. And I cannot get that out of my of my head. He said he has chosen me. Of course, I didn't want to be chosen because I love the world so much, unfortunately. Uh, but he continued pursuing my heart until at 16 years old, I entered it. I just knew that I had to enter. I, I, I could not see myself being who I am, who I am called to be in the world. I just wanted to belong totally to Jesus. And um, so, and then I entered that 16. And we are not old. encouraging people to skip class. But if you do skip class, no. <laughs> make sure you head to the chapel right away because you might yes. have a message from God. Uh, but you know what is beautiful is that God is going to encounter, pursue you wherever you go and to encounter you wherever you go. Absolutely. And you know, the, the funny, I think this was Augustine that said, you know, Lord, make me a saint, but not yet. And so it seems like, seems like that same mentality. <laughs> like, I, you know, I want this, but I also like the yes. stuff because you had a boyfriend at the time and then this started stirring. I had a boyfriend. I dated him for about two years or a little bit more than two years. And also... I'm not encouraging this, but he was like four years older than me. Yeah, so, so it's, I, but you know, that had to be really difficult to let go of all of that because you were really trying to be, have a life that was, you know, totally different than the life that, that God was yes. asking you to do. I mean, that's a huge contrast. 
Yes, but I think that in my case, I needed an experience like that, something that really shook me to the core in order to be able to hear God's voice. I, I got I, I, this. <laughs> your vocation story is something that I do tell people just because it's it's so great. And it's so memorable. <laughs> and uh, in, in it gives me hope because I think a lot of us feel broken and hopeless and and and, and particularly with religious life, there is this. Uh, mentality of people saying, well, I'm not a saint or I'm not holy, so I can't become a religious. And uh, that's just wrong. That's that's the opposite way of thinking. And in fact, if that's something you so desire, then that's a great place to look for that or to pursue that. And, and another thing that I think is remarkable about your story is I think it holds true to this um, template, so to speak, of, of introduction to the religious life. A lot of the people that I talk to on this show every Thursday, they talk about that uh, the fact that they had an encounter with religious themselves. And so this is really important that we're creating potential encounters with religious and that religious are enacting are, uh, are, are having interactions with community and, and so that we can see them and that they're visible because it will give us more opportunities to see that. Now, as, as a superior and, and looking at the growth of your community, are you seeing that as an important part of interacting with, with, uh, with the laity to make sure that you're known? Oh, yes. Yes, definitely. That is so important. Because also sometimes laity that has that have never seen sisters, they have this image of sisterhood that is completely inaccurate. I mean, we like good laughs. We are like normal people. We eat, we we do everything that normal people does. Just that, of course, our goal, like many of the lay people that I know, like you, your goal is still to please God and to love God, even in, in the midst of all the work and everything that you have to do. So definitely, we try to make ourselves as present to people as possible. Like, uh, we go to camps a lot. We go. To, uh, there is one big camp here that is called the Damascus Camp and Family Land here in Ohio. So Family Land, this is the first summer that some of our sisters are going to go to Family Land to participate with parents, with children, with babies, with everything. And then other, uh, like about nine other sisters are going to take three different weeks at the camp with teenagers. So, so because we like that, we like to camp also, we like to be with people and it's beautiful to have fun with people that have God at the center of their heart. So these teenagers need to know that they can, Jesus can be pursuing them to become priests, to become sisters, that there is more. There is always more. Would you say that those experiences with religious foster, just in general, a healthier relationship with vo vocational discernment on the whole, whether it is religious or, or married life or, mm -hmm. or priesthood? Definitely. We talk to them not only about religious vocation, we talk to them how the whole world needs holy matrimonies. We need, see, even as religious, we love to see people with uh, that love each other, that they marry, they have their children, and they struggle because we struggle. So we sustain them with our prayers. But we see, when we see the sacrifice that parents make with their babies, with raising a family, it also inspires, inspires us. So we say, okay, look at all the sacrifices they are making for their children. We have to make sacrifices for our spiritual children too. So it's like we help each other. We set each other on fire. It's beautiful friendships with people that are married. So we present that to the children and we make sure that we, uh, they invite sisters, but they invite uh, these couples that are very holy and married. So they can see both vocations, that both vocations are fulfilling and that both vocations call us to sanctity. So I would imagine that being a religious community and trying to ex express that and to try to draw new people into your community, there's a balance between being open to God's will and his role in growing your community and making it a fulfilling experience and the fact that you actually have to physically do something, but it's, 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 uh, it's mostly God and then, then there's your role to physically do something. How do you navigate as, as, you know, managing all of this? How do you navigate that balance? Because I think sometimes we just want to have control, take it over, go after it. But then other times we just have to let God work. And that can be really hard to do, to like let go of that. 
you know, the danger if I were to control and to just try to grasp the girls and get them into religious life, the danger of that is that they would enter because of me or they would enter not because they have had an experience of the love of God. So if you enter religious life without having had that experience that God loves me so much and I want to love him back, you're not going to endure religious life or you're not going to be happy in religious life. So I do ask uh, ask the basic questions to the girls that are uh, trying to discern with us. Okay, have you dated before? Uh, what What is your experience of religious life? Tell me about uh, if you have always thought about being a mother. Because, see, those are things that are so necessary to enter religious life. Not that you need to date, but you. I want normal people in my convent. I want girls that dream of a, of a, of a marriage, that dream of having babies, that... Because that's who we are crea- created to be. We are created to be spouses, to give life, to carry a baby in, in our womb. Th- that's how women naturally have that tendency. And I want normal women to come into religious life. Of course, when we have an experience of God, and especially because we have experience that God, in our case, has called us to be totally his, I don't reject this. I just say a mm-hmm. yes to something else. But I am still called to intimacy. But this, in this case, intimacy is going to be with Jesus. And, and he can be so intimate. He, he can talk to our heart. He can talk to our soul. He, he, Jesus knows how to be very intimate in that friendship that he offers us. But also, I want these girls to have that thirst mm-hmm. for motherhood. So they can give their life to the children and you that we work with. They need to become mothers. So as I tell my, my sister's information, we have to practice motherhood with each other before we go outside. So if I see a sister that is feeling sick, I bring her a cup of tea. I stay with her. If, I, if she's crying, okay, can I pray with you? We have to mother each other so we can learn to, learn to mother children. Is and that it, but well, I was going to say, is that a concern yes. if somebody's coming in and they're overly scrupulous or slightly self-righteous that they, they suppress those natural tendencies of motherhood? Maybe because that's what they think you're looking for. Or is it, that's an amazing yes. dynamic. Can you walk me through that a little? And you know what, Jess? Um, let, let me just say something before uh, responding to your question. Many girls, or the temptation that I see nowadays, is that many girls think that, oh, I, ha- I am very broken. I cannot enter religious life. That's a lie. Because nowadays in this 21st century, I think that 99.9% of us are broken. I mean, we, co- we don't come, not all of us come from families with mom and dad, and then everybody eating dinner together. And just, I, I mean, that is not happening anymore. So these young girls are coming from broken families, most of them. But it's not, brokenness is not a problem because the more broken you are, the more mercy you receive from God. The problem is that, and, and that's what we do in the three years of formation, they have to confront their brokenness. They have to bring it to Jesus and say, I'm not scared of my brokenness because I have a healer in front of me. So they have to accept that they are broken and that they have scrupulosity or they have um, anxiety or they have, but I am going to accept who I am, accept my brokenness, my woundedness, and I'm going to put myself in front of those long hours of adoration that we have and just ask the healer to, I'm here and I am broken, but you can heal me. And sometimes in my experience, my own brokenness has helped me to understand other people because I don't get scared. It's like, oh, oh, you're going to get scared, sister, when I tell you this. No, and you're broken, and so am I in different ways. So no, just let let me help you to dispose yourself to be healed by Christ. Absolutely, and and so again, like you're just to reiterate the people, girls may be coming in overly scrupulous or you know slightly self righteous. Is how how do you decide whether or not you're going to take them in and mold them and figure that out with them, or maybe they're just not mm-hmm. ready for that? Because that's got to be a hard decision. Yes, it is. It implies a lot of prayer. I always tell Jesus uh, it's a huge responsibility. And I know that one day when I die, I'm going to see Papa face to face. And he's going to say, OK, I send you all these girls. And, and I am like, yeah, I know. Uh, so I pray a lot. And, and I tell the, the, the girls 
this. Okay, you are going to pray and I am going to pray. And, and I tell them, this is what I'm going to pray. If this girl is meant to be a religious, and if she's meant for my community, Jesus, allow her to just go over all the obstacles. Either they might be financial, they can might be psych psychological, they might be family issues. Help her to overcome all these obstacles and enter my community. But if she hasn't been called or she hasn't been called to my community, Jesus, help me to discern with her. And I ask the, the girl, uh, if this is not, uh, you cannot enter just by the power of the will. You have to pray. You have to be called. It's not, you don't choose religious life. You are chosen and you just say yes to religious life. So, and, and sometimes when I don't feel peace, I tell them, you know what? I have prayed a lot about you. And for some reason, I don't feel peace. So why we don't put it down, like, let's say, some months, a year? And then if you, are you, if you are being still pursued by Christ, then call me again and then we can talk about it. And, and there are some girls that just from the moment that I talk to them, it's like, wow, I, it, it just feels like another daughter, a natural daughter. Okay. And I have had successful stories with both. Girls that after two, three years, they call again and then, okay, visit again. And they have matured so beautifully. And it's like, okay, I think it's time now. And there are girls that never call again. So it's like, okay, so uh, maybe, uh, and sometimes they call me, oh, I'm going to get married and I'm happy to. I remember this beautiful girl that came to me and said, you know what? And, and look at the beauty of this girl. I am, I was dating a boy, but I told him to please give me time because I'm going to discern religious life. But she was crying with me and she said, but Madre, I love him so much. He's such a good boy. And I know that I, I can see myself getting married to him. And he goes to mass every day. And he's a beautiful uh, boy. And I told her, well, <laughs> what are you waiting? And she said, but what if God wants me to be a sister? I said, look, you are completely in love with this boy. This is a good Catholic boy. For God's sake, <laughs> marry him. <laughs> and just... And they have two beautiful babies right now. Uh, so, yes, I mean, it, it's good. It's good that we discern where God is calling them. And I tell them, while you are discerning, if you are undecided where God is calling you, and then the prince of your dreams comes, and it's a Catholic boy, you know that you can grow in sanctity with him and you fall in love with him. God has already told you what your vocation is. So don't, don't insist in the religious vocation when God is showing you. Here, you have a good marriage. Yeah, go, go where God's actually calling you, not where you think God wants you to be. And, and we hear this a lot from yes. people. You know, there's probably peace in there, too. And, and the anxiety came from, oh, probably in her situation. I don't want to, you know, uh, overly surmise. But it probably came from this idea, well, that's probably what I should do. And religious life is such yes. a sacrifice. Yeah. And by doing the thing that I want to do, I'm not making that sacrifice. So it's probably the worst of the two things. And we, and we get into these cycles oh, of like, yes. whoa, whoa, whoa. Like that, there is good and, and there are good marriages. There's so many good things about being married. Um, yeah. The thing that keeps coming into my mind as hearing these stories and the things that you're doing in your community there is the word authentic. Because... I mean, I, I can't think of a religious community when I was younger that I could imagine saying, oh, hey, I'm, I'm interested because in, in my mind, they just want to get anybody they can get. And if I told them I was going to go get married, they'd, <laughs> I'd be worried about them being disappointed. But you said, no, go. And there's something really beautiful, natural yeah. and authentic about that. So um, my question is, is this authenticity something that's drawing people to your community? Because you're, you're experiencing uh, unprecedented growth and you think that's a contributing factor the first factor is the mercy of god i mean god is being so merciful to us and he is a generous god um and he is the one that is really drawing them what i find out when i go to universities and to other places is that many many of these young people are falling in love with jesus in the eucharist and that is a very important aspect of our community, our love for Jesus in the Eucharist, making reparation to Jesus in the Eucharist, trying to bring other people to Jesus in the Eucharist, bringing Jesus in the Eucharist to other people, that I think that that's what is drawing them to our community. There are two pillars of our community, the love for Jesus in the Eucharist, and we spend many hours of adoration in front of Jesus, a lot of prayer time in the chapel, and our great love for Mary. 
And many young people have those two things as very important in their lives. So when they look at us and they see that we really mean it, that we want to give our whole life to Jesus in the Eucharist, that we want to become Eucharist for the whole world, and that we cannot do it without the help of Mama Mary, they are drawn to, to that truth, that yes, Jesus is living there in, their, in that convent, and Mama Mary is just by their side, and I think that that is them who is attracting them. And, and so uh, you, you are experiencing a lot of growth. So how, as a community, do you handle that? And, and, and how, how do you manage that? Because there's, there's a lot of different ways. You could say, well, this is an anomaly and, you know, this is only a, a <laughs> couple of years where we're having a lot of people. But, but at a certain point, yes. you have to plan for this growth and you have to be able to provide for this entire community. And, um, you know, you're, you're working on building a, a new building. Is that correct? Uh, that, yes, we, uh, like you said at the beginning, it's like, oh, okay, we are receiving one, two girls. So we are, but now it's like, oh, groups of four, groups of more than four. Now, right now I have, normally I received uh, applications until April, May, late. But in the, by December, I already had four applications. And uh, there are more girls coming. And it's like, oh my gosh. So we are outgrowing, thanks be to God, our content, definitely. So for next year, I can see that many of us are going to have to be double up in in the cells we call our room bedroom cells so yes we then began okay papa i guess it's time for uh, you are blessing us with vocations it's time to build a novitiate house properly done and uh, i don't know if you guys can see well let me show you uh this is the group of sisters information okay and then this is how the house is going to the novitiate house is going to look we own a property in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. So, and um, thank God we had a beautiful person that is helping us uh, with the blueprints are, are, are already ready. And he, he designed everything for us. And so now we just have to fund it. <laughs> and we are going to begin very soon with a capital campaign trying to fund the novitiate house. It's going to, it's 17 sales. So they are going to be big enough so we can double up if needed be. But just by next year, if we were able to have it, we are already, we would have easily 14 cells occupied already with Formation Sisters. So um, so I can see that probably we are going to finish up doubling up in that convent too. But thanks be to God. I mean, we are not complaining. <laughs> we are so happy. And you know what? Yes, I just said, how are you going to provide? I know that Papa will provide. Uh, like that is one of the things that I said, oh my gosh, what are we going to do to provide for all these girls? And they have to get their masters in theology. So how are we going to provide? Papa has, parishioners have come and said, oh sister, don't worry. Every week I'm going to bring veggies to you. Another parishioner, oh, here is bread. Every day he brings bread to the community. And just, uh, and other parishioners that come and say, oh, I was at Sam's, and then your community came into my mind. So I said, oh, to my wife, oh, let's buy this meat for them. Let's. So it has been nonstop for the past four or five years of people just knocking at our door and, sister, I have this for you. It's just living, trusting the divine providence is mm -hmm. awesome, yes. It's awesome. God is such a generous That God. is such a great thing to hear. And my other question is, so at a certain point, you have to say this growth is real. It's happening. We need to provide for it. And because it, otherwise you say, well, you do this and then maybe numbers go down and then you went through all this effort. But again, there's something happening here. There's something authentic. My other question is, um, do you when when you start when the numbers start getting bigger, do you expand your charism and the work that you do? Is it okay. is it expanding into other fields or do you try to still plug into the same thing that's been working all the time? Uh, our constitution say that our charism is uh, to bring the Eucharist and bring children and youth to the Eucharist. So that is like our focus, the young people, the children and the young people. So it can be in schools, yes, but also we are at the University of Florida. And right now we uh, send five juniors, for, so five young sisters that just profess with one of our pro fully professed sisters to Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And they are working as... Um, uh, they are ministering a high school 
and they are min beginning to minister at LSU. They are they are being invited to participate already in some of the University of Louisiana uh, things. So uh, activities. So we are expanding. We are definitely we are expanding. We have. Uh, uh, I don't want to disclose yet because it is being treated, but we have invitations from other dioceses um, to go and, and work in their schools as youth ministers. So, so yes, we. I mean, it's funny, but how God is sending vocations, and at the same time, God is opening, sending invitations from bishops for us to come to their dioceses. So it's asking, God is doing both things at the same time. And we just tell them so, to some of the dioceses, we said, okay, please wait three years. So like the Diocese of St. Augustine, because they, we are established there, we asked them to wait about three, four years. And she said, okay, in three, four years, we had enough sisters to send there. So they are there doing wonderful things in, in, at the University of Florida. And then uh, we have these other dioceses and we told them, please wait to one, three years, to the other one, five years. But, and I told them, but if God continues blessing us with more and more and more vocations, maybe instead of five years, it would, it would be two, three years. Because, I mean, we cannot have, we don't like to have a, co a comment of 50, 60 sisters. We'd rather just have communities of six sisters so they can just spread and bring Jesus to all these young people. That is fantastic. And I love to hear the success that's happening here and the growth that's happening here. And really, like you said, I love when I asked you about, you know, what are you doing to do this growth? That you, your first response was Jesus and the Eucharist and God's mercy. And so that tells me <laughs> yeah. that you're, you're going in the right direction here. If, if somebody is interested in, in either helping with your capital campaign or helping with any of these needs that you have for formation for the sisters or maybe doing a visit uh, for the community, where can they go to find out more information? Our website, www.mercedariansisters.org. Uh, if, they, if they want to give money, they can go to the last tab that says Donate. And when they click that one, the first thing that comes up is this project of the, of the novitiate house. And then they can just donate there. But also, if they want to donate for the um, ongoing formation of the sisters, that is for the Fully Prophet sisters, so if they want to just donate for our studies of the sisters, they, they are different things that they want to donate, that can donate for. And if they want to contact me, my cell phone number is right there at the bottom of the of the website. I think that in any page, my phone is at the bottom. So they, if they want more information, they are more than welcome to come. Also, once they donate, they receive a thank you card, uh, and then also that we keep in contact so we can keep them informed. Like, okay, today we just bless the place. Today we put the first the first stone. Today we are building. So they can be informed of how it is progressing. So so we will keep them informed. Excellent. Of everything. Well, I, I posted a link to that website in the chat here. Uh, oh, my last you. question before we go is, uh, you know, we talked a yeah. little bit about your vocation story and I'll, I'll, God just threw you right in, right into the right direction here, and now now you're leading this whole thing, and you're you're making decisions, and and uh, a huge major piece. Along right, with other right, right, professors. Right. So <laughs> my my final yeah. question is, how how do you process that from from where you started to where you are now, and and how God is using you uh, to do His work? What 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 goes through your mind? Oh, normally, yes, I cry <laughs> when, when I begin to see all these, the, all these, all my spiritual daughters and how beautiful they are, how full of love they are for God. I just cry <laughs> and I'm about to, be, to cry to see. I mean, I just go. I don't even have time sometimes to process this. I just go to the to the chapel and I just tell Jesus, Jesus, I mean, you deserve everything you can do with me, whatever you want. I mean. I, you are just the best thing that could have ever happened to me. And, and I just wish that many, many, many more people, young and adults and old, that they would have an experience of the love of Christ. Because, so it just impels me to, to want to talk to many people and say, oh, please, you have to come and, and meet Jesus because he's awesome. He's, I'm like the Samaritan woman. I want to just run out and tell everybody what he has done for me and in my Excellent. life. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for sharing 
your story, but then also sharing the mission of what you're doing and sharing the joy and the love of our Lord through the Eucharist and through God's mercy. It's just such a refreshing thing to be able to, to hear these success stories because it's important to have hope. And I think what you're, what you're doing yes, provides that yes. hope. And uh, it, it is always good to do that, not so that we can rest on our laurels, but that, so that we can have energy to, to keep going and to push forward. So thank you so much for your time, uh, Mother. I really appreciate thank it. You. And, and, and You're welcome. And just to close with something that my spiritual director told me the other day, and I was in all the darkness sometimes that we feel in the world. And he said from John 1 uh, that, yes, there is a lot of darkness. And uh, but also the light will never be overcome by darkness. And we have to know that. that yeah, absolutely. Yes. So there is much more light than darkness. Yeah, it depends on where we look, right? <laughs> yes. All right. Well, God bless, Mother. I appreciate it. Yes, thank you.